Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we study your word, we are well aware that we cannot understand your word without the power and influence of the Holy Spirit dwelling here. And we believe that the Holy Spirit has been here through the reading of scripture, through the singing of songs. And now, Lord, through the study of your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin, convict us of righteousness, and convict us of the judgment to come. And we pray, Lord, that the Spirit would lead us into all truth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The phrase, know that I am the Lord, occurs over 60 times in the 48 chapters of Ezekiel, and we have embarked on a journey studying the book of Ezekiel to explore how each of us might come to know God, come to know Him who saved us. Eight major themes arise from the book of Ezekiel and how we each might come to know God. We can know him through the experience of salvation and being delivered from sin. We can know him through experiencing his covenant. We can know him through the sanctuary. We can know him through prophecy. We can know him through the Sabbath. We can know him through judgment. We can know him through final judgment. And then we can know him through his return and restoration of all things. Today is the fourth part in that eight-part series, to know and be known. Now, if you have missed any previous week, you can go to battlecreektabernacle.com and there you can listen or watch the archives. Ultimately, my goal through this series is to answer the question, how can I know God in a deeply personal way? How can I have an experience where the Lord is not in competition with anyone or with anything in my life? How can I come out of a Babel, out of Babylon or a Babylonian-like thinking that has something or something someone rather, in the place of our relationship with God. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, verses 24 to 28. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 24 to 28. The Bible says, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Ezekiel saw a vision of the future, a conditional prophecy. The chapter begins with Ezekiel writing names on two sticks. Those names are the names that represented the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom which had been divided. Those sticks were to be mended and it represented the restoration and unity of Israel. Then they would have one shepherd forever. They would dwell in the land that God gave them forever. They would have the covenant restored forever. 
This was the vision that Ezekiel had, a conditional prophecy that had God's people complied with the conditions of that prophecy, we would not be experiencing what we all are experiencing today. In addition to those promises, in the midst of those verses, in verses 26 through 28, Ezekiel, through a message he received from God, said, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. God's sanctuary, his tabernacle. It was to be in their midst forever. God was to be their God and they were to be his people. The nations would know that God is the one that sanctifies Israel. Now if this verse sounds familiar to you, it is because in the book of Revelation, In Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4, it alludes to this very passage in Ezekiel. You'll remember uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4 says this. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The conditional prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37 that was not fulfilled because of the disobedience of God's people will be fulfilled in the future when God restores his people to their home, to a perfect earth, and a universe that is untainted by one iota of sin. Now, while not as explicit as the other passages in Ezekiel, Ezekiel is clear that we can know God and experience God in a powerful way through his sanctuary. It is very interesting, as a matter of fact, that the word sanctuary occurs 36 times in the book of Ezekiel. The word temple occurs 48 times in Ezekiel, and the word tabernacle two times. Four, excuse me, 86 times in 48 chapters, God references his sanctuary. Now, when we look at all of those verses, many of those verses speak of the restoration of the sanctuary. Some of them speak of the desecration and abominations of the sanctuary. Those desecrations and abominations of the sanctuary are a demonstration that God's people were not in tune with him and they really did not know him. While the restoration of the sanctuary demonstrated change, demonstrated a transformation in a deeper knowledge of God. Further back in the history of God's people, the Bible is very clear. In Exodus chapter 29. In Exodus chapter 29, beginning in verse 46, this is what the word of God says. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Why? That I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. When we understand that passage in the context it is given, which is Exodus 25, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. 
The sanctuary was a demonstration of God's desire. God's desire to dwell with his people. That has been his desire since the very creation of humanity. When humanity chose to rebel against God, God came to the garden in the midst of that broken relationship and he asked a question. And his question was very simple. Where are you? And let us be clear that when God asked that question, he was not in need of Google Maps. He was not in need of ways. This was not a question of geography. This was a question of spiritual orientation of Adam. Where are you, Adam? I'm right here. I've never left you. Where are you? And that is the question that God has attempted to answer from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. It is God's relentless pursuit to dwell with his special creation. And so when God's people had spent 400 years in Egypt and had forgotten him for all practical purposes... God asked them to build a sanctuary that he could dwell with them. The sanctuary's placement, its physical location was a demonstration of what God's desire is. The sanctuary was set up in the very middle of the camp. It is God conveying to each of us that his desire is that he would reside right in our very heart, that he would be the center of our life. Psalm 132 and verse 13 says this, for the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place, this is my resting place forever, here I will dwell for I have desired it. The implication of that passage is that God cannot rest until he dwells with us. The sanctuary and the services of the sanctuary pointed forward to Jesus Christ who later would dwell literally among men. The Hebrew word dwell actually conveys the idea of permanent resident in the community. The sanctuary was to be a visible reminder of God's desire to dwell permanently with his people, to be at the very center of worship, the very center of life. The sanctuary was a direct contrast to the polytheistic nations that were surrounding Israel. The sanctuary was to help bring God in their minds near his people. It made his presence very real. And we need to be reminded that the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. And while there have been many attempts over the course of years to deny the existence of the heavenly sanctuary, you cannot deny that which the Bible clarifies as true that there is a sanctuary in heaven. The earthly sanctuary was to provide a demonstration of the process of salvation and reconciliation. It pointed clearly to each of our needs for Jesus Christ. In fact, the heavenly sanctuary is the headquarters of salvation in the universe and it is also the place where God is dealing with sin. So the copy on earth was set up to help us each understand first, how God is dealing with sin. Second, 
to teach us that God is with us and he is the one that strengthens us. How is it that God is dealing with sin? While this sermon is not a comprehensive teaching on the sanctuary, we can journey through the sanctuary to see how God is dealing with sin. There is the courtyard of the sanctuary. The courtyard teaches us that there is a breach in the relationship. Sin caused separation from God. And there is something that is required to heal that breach that there is between us and him. In the sanctuary service, that was an innocent lamb. A lamb without spot or blemish was to be brought by the sinner. To be brought by the head of the household. To be brought there to the courtyard where he would pray and lay his hands on that innocent lamb and figuratively speaking his sins would be transferred from himself into that lamb and then the lamb would be killed some people will say this is quite brutal that is because there is a very key lack of understanding in the 21st century, sin kills. Sin is serious. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The word remission literally means forgiveness and liberty. Leviticus 17 tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. The lamb pointed forward to the reality that Jesus Christ is our substitute. He has died for us. He has died for my sins. He has died for your sins. And by doing so, he has made you free. But let us not be deceived. In order to receive the salvation that Christ has provided, it requires a choice. We must accept the provision he has made, just as in the sanctuary. The sanctuary was there. The sanctuary existed. But if I did not bring a lamb, I would not receive the remission of sins that was offered there in the sanctuary. I needed to take the lamb. And then there is the altar of burnt offering. The lamb was taken to the altar of burnt offering where the lamb was offered and burned in the fire, consumed. It demonstrates the reality that Jesus poured out everything. He poured out everything. He gave the entirety of his life for you and for me, that we no longer need to walk around as the walking dead, but we can be made alive through his exhaustive sacrifice. And then before entering into the holy place is the laver. The laver was a place of cleansing where the priest would cleanse himself before any of his work and doing that sacrifice. It represents the cleansing water of Jesus. In fact, this journey is summarized succinctly by David. We know the story of David. A married man. went out onto his porch and saw a woman bathing. It 
It would have been okay had he just turned his eyes away. But the Bible gives the indication that David beheld and gazed. We know the rest of the story. We know how David took the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah, one of his mighty men, one of the men who committed to give his life for David, and David took his wife from him. A conscientious, a conscious decision, rather, to commit adultery. A conscious decision to hide it. A conscious decision when it became evident that he might be outed to make sure the secret was forever sealed by having Uriah the Hittite murdered. And in the midst of all of that, God through his prophet Nathan stood in front of the king and with boldness pointed the finger at him and said, you are that man. And with a broken and contrite heart, David wrote Psalm 51, summarizing the journey into the sanctuary. Have mercy upon me, O God, Psalm 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. The word blot is a beautiful word. Literally in the Hebrew it means to abolish, to annihilate, to destroy, and it conveys the idea of total and complete erasure, to be removed from you. David didn't want just behavior modification. Oh Lord, help me not to do that again. He wanted transformation. He knew he was a wretch. He knew he was a sinner. And he asked God, blot out my transgression. He continues in verse 9, hide your face from my iniquities and blot out, excuse me, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43 and verse 25 continues with this thought. I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. In, ver in chapter 44 and verse 22, I have blotted out your sin like a thick cloud, your transgressions, and like a cloud, your sins return to me, for I have redeemed you. This is the desire of God's heart that he would blot out our sins. He would blot out our transgressions. He would remove them from us. Which is why in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is the desire of God to abolish, to annihilate, to eliminate, to destroy the sin in our life. This word blot is the very word used to describe what happened at the flood when it said it would blot out every living creature. This is the desire of God and he knows to restore this earth. Sin must be blotted out. By the way, this is also the same word from the earlier verse we read in Revelation 21, 4. And he will wipe away every tear. The word wipe away is the word blot. I don't know about you, 
But I'm looking forward to a time where there'll be no reason to cry. There will be no sadness, there will be no death, there will be no more dying because God has wiped out and annihilated and destroyed sin. This is the teaching of the sanctuary. It helps us to understand how serious sin is. Sin kills. It killed the very Son of God. Too often we treat sin as some oops. Oops. Just remember that oops. Nailed Jesus to the cross. This is why John the Baptist in John 1.29, John 1.29 said about Jesus that he is the Lamb of God. He didn't stop there though, did he? That takes away the sin of the world. The journey through the sanctuary presents a choice to us, a very real and important choice. And that choice is this. We will either have our sin blotted away or we will be blotted away. The warning of the book of Revelation in Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, the garment of Christ's righteousness. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. Let us be very, very clear. God's love, God's loving kindness, God's mercy does not deny God's justice. His love is so loving that it cannot permit sin. His love is so loving that it destroys sin. Sin is adverse to the very presence of God. God's character is perfect, perfectly merciful, and perfectly just. And even if we do not understand that, does not mean, does not mean that we can deny either his mercy or his justice. This is the work of justification. God taking away our sin. But then we move from that labor into the holy place where there in the holy place it shows us what the sanctifying process of God looks like. There at the table of showbread, we are reminded of the words of Jesus that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How is it that this God who, who, who removes our sin, blots our sin from us as we confess to him, How can we come to know him by spending time in his word? This is why in Psalm 119, there is such a great emphasis on the word. Psalm 119, verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you're struggling with an addiction in your life, if you're struggling to follow the ways of God in your life. Hide his word in your heart that you might be strengthened in that time to quote a scripture to help you overcome. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The young people sang of how we are that light. Well, the only way that I can be a light is if I have the light of God. And his light is in his word. And then in three very quick verses of Psalm 119, verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. You want to experience revival in your life? We can go to a revival weekend 
We can listen to a revival preacher, but revival won't occur until we're spending time in the Word. Verse 28, my soul melts with heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. You feeling weak? The Bible is your strength. And then verse 42, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. I'm going to tell you, my dear friends, there are going to be moments in your life where it doesn't make sense, where things happen that are unfair and unjust. There will be things that happen in our life where we pray and we pray and we pray and the very opposite of what we pray for happens. And we don't understand as we look all around and we see people who are seemingly doing awful and terrible things being rewarded and we're wondering what's going on. There will be those times where it doesn't make sense. But my dear friends, there is only one thing that is trustworthy in this life and that is the word of God. We are living in a society where you can't even have an opinion about the color that you see. The sky is blue. Uh, uh, You know, I don't really know. I think the sky is red. Why do you think the sky is red? Well, because that's what I think. And because I think it, you have to accept it. And while I'm being a bit ridiculous, this is the society we live in. There are many things that will not make sense. The word of God is the only thing that is trustworthy. And by the way, there may be times where even his word doesn't make sense. But just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean I should. If the word of God forbids it, then I should not. If the word of God says something about who Jesus is, who God is, and I don't understand it, I am simply called to trust the word and follow what it says. Then in addition to that first apartment of the sanctuary, the holy place, is the seven-branched candlestick filled with oil. It is a representation of the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God in our life. We need to spend time in the Word daily, but we also need the power of the Holy Spirit daily in our life. Because the Word without the Spirit is a lamp without oil. Putting it into modern vernacular, the word without the spirit is like a car without gas. It may look nice, it may have nice gadgets, but it's not taking you anywhere. And then in that holy place, the altar of incense, a representation of prayer. The sanctifying process of God is outlined in Bible study, in having the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and in prayer. There are things that will happen when we pray that would have never happened if we didn't pray. As Debbie and I have had the opportunity to work in a variety of fields over two decades of ministry, the places that are the most successful are not the places that have the best techniques and methodology. It is those places that pray. 
in Calgary, Alberta in 2016. Debbie and I had the opportunity to go there and do an evangelistic series in the city of Calgary, 1.2 million people. Calgary, Alberta, called the Bible Belt of Canada. Just to give you context, less than 50% of the people claim Christianity there, which means it's a very secular place. It was the first time in our North American evangelistic experience that on opening night, we had the least amount of people. And by the way, there were still a lot of people. There were 1,000 people there that opening night. Then the next weekend, there were 1,150 people. Then the next weekend, there were 1,250 people. And the following weekend, I told people, you better get here early because these folks are going to make us shut the doors and not let some people in. We had 1,650 people on that final weekend. We had to close the doors at 1,250 and send people down to the local church where it was being live streamed. And this had nothing to do with me as a preacher and my fanciful preaching. This had everything to do with the power of God and a strong prayer team that understood we were not in the midst of a battle of flesh and blood. But we were in the midst of a battle of the principalities and powers of the air. The sanctuary teaches us that you want to experience the power of God in your life. You want to know God. We need to pray. Some people will say to me, what does that mean? It means talking to God as a friend. For me in my own personal prayer, I use an acronym, ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration. I thank God for who he is. You know, we often say God is love. And that is very true. But the Bible contains over 90 characteristics of God. If you do a little search, God is, the Lord is, you will find. God is our strength. God is our refuge. God is our deliverer. There's even a passage that says, God is a man of war. And sometimes we say, how can God be love and God be a man of war? Because when I'm in the battle of sin, I want a man of war fighting on my behalf. God will fight for you. So I spend time thanking God for who he is. Confession, C. The Bible says, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive my sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. T. Thanksgiving. What's the difference between thanksgiving and praise? Praise or adoration is thanking God for who he is. Thanksgiving is thanking God for what he's done. And I want to encourage you if you're not doing it. Because it's really easy to say, God never answers my prayers. Start writing your prayers down. I prayed this morning when I drove from Hickory Corners to Battle Creek that the Lord would protect us and the Lord would help our car to work right. And by the way, that's not because I'm afraid that my car's not gonna work right. I pray that when I'm in a brand new car. There's a lot that can go wrong. I'm not a mechanic, but I know there's a lot that can go wrong. God answered both of those prayers. Most of us are going to eat something when we're done here today. Are we thanking God for what he's provided? God answers our prayers. We need to keep track of that. And then supplication, the S of A-C-T-S. Bringing your prayers before God. Who are you praying for? I pray for my family. I pray for friends. I pray for you. I pray for what's going on in my life. I do use a prayer list. This is what that holy place experience teaches us about the sanctuary. And then there is the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat, the throne of God. God's very presence within the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the manna and Aaron's rod. 
The priest only went in to the most holy place once per year on the day of atonement. Throughout the year, if you study the sanctuary, when the sacrifices were made, the priest would take the blood and he would take it into the sanctuary. But on the day of atonement, there was something different that happened. He took the blood, and when I say take it into the sanctuary, he would put it on the altar, he would put it on the various places, sprinkle it in the various places on his way in, transferring, by the way, the sin of the lamb, which, excuse me, the blood of the lamb onto the sanctuary, which is a representation of God taking on our sin. God removing that sin from us. But then on the day of atonement, he would take the blood and go all the way into the most holy place and he would sprinkle the blood on the way out. Which is a demonstration that the day of atonement is the flow of blood is coming out because the sins were being removed from the sanctuary. And as that sin was removed from the sanctuary, symbolically, the priest would lay his hands upon the scapegoat That scapegoat is a representation of Satan, a representation of God's eternal separation of those who are not willing for him to blot out their sin. On the Day of Atonement, God returned the sin and impurity to its true source and originator. The scapegoat was the right of elimination from sin and impurity. It was not a sacrificial act. And the placing of that sin on Azazel, the scapegoat, indicated the demonic origin origin of sin. And it returned it to its place. And this is very serious, friends, because it looks forward to and serves as a representation of God's destruction of Satan and how he will deal with sin. Matthew 25, 41 is very clear. Then he also said to those on his left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never God's intention that any person would end up in the lake of fire. God was going to deal with the devil and his angels and that is how he would deal with them. And it was prepared by God to deal with the devil and his angels at an appointed time. But the parable of Matthew 25 teaches us very clearly there will be those who cling to their sin rather than having it blotted out and then they will be blotted out in the lake of fire. This is why Jesus himself said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. This is very serious, my dear friends, because it is only God who gives life, and it is only God who can take it away. Life did not just come to be. We did not just come to existence through evolution. We did not come into existence through an accident. God doesn't deal with sin in a passive way. And it is a grand lesson of the sanctuary. God isn't passive. God isn't just sitting around. But God is active. He sent his son so he could die as your substitute because it was required. He is actively working for your salvation. He's actively working for my salvation. And he is active in eliminating sin from this planet and ultimately the universe. Those that teach otherwise are teaching a simple, recycled version of deism. Deism teaches that God basically created the earth, set it on a whirl, and abandoned the planet, and let everything come to an end through its own natural processes, where God is impersonal and not involved in the everyday life of humanity. The sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant, Stand as an affront to such a teaching. And we must not fall for that deception. The sanctuary teaches us 
that God desires to dwell with you and he's doing everything he can to dwell with you. He wants to be with you. And the Ark of the Covenant is a demonstration of the glorification that will happen when Jesus comes again. The sanctuary is the story of our salvation. Justification, I was saved. Sanctification, I am being saved. Glorification, I will be saved. Each has an assurance in and of itself. He saved us when we made a decision to give our life to him. He is saving us as we daily die to self and submit to his will. Excuse me, submit to his will in our life. And he will save us as we choose to be faithful to him. And the sanctuary then teaches us, in addition to all of that, that Jesus is on his throne. And he is the sustainer and strengthener of all of us. This is why the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 8 in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul, and I can, you know, Paul was writing this, but I can imagine in my mind, if you would allow me to imagine in my mind, that if he was preaching this as a sermon, he would shout this from the mountaintop. And this is the main point of the things we are saying. That word main point means the chief point. The primary thing we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Paul is crying out and helping us to know we are not serving a dead savior. We are serving a risen savior who is seated at the right hand of God in the sanctuary in heaven. A high priest, which earlier in Hebrews 4 says this, seeing then that we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It should come as no surprise. It should come as no surprise that through the centuries, Satan has attacked the sanctuary, trying to get God's people to turn away from the sanctuary so people would not come to know him as Lord. In fact, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 8, and we don't have time to go through it all, there are great abominations that happen in the sanctuary. They worship creeping things and abominable beasts and idols. Ezekiel 8 tells us that the women were weeping for Tammuz. Ezekiel 8 tells us that the men had turned their back on the sanctuary and were worshiping, facing their faces toward the east and the rising sun. And this is all manifest today. And if I can summarize all of it, Satan has worked to turn our attention from heaven to the earth. He has worked to turn many people's attention to the sun. Sun, S-U-N. He has worked because Tammuz was in mythology the husband of Ishtar. Ishtar, the goddess of fertility and permus per permiscuity. Satan has done everything to destroy the family. And its application spiritually is to bring people into spiritual or religious syncretism. 
worshiping two gods, but believing they're worshiping one. Working to turn God's people away from the creator by having them worship the creation, having them forget God's holy Sabbath day. Ezekiel 8, which is all about the abominations of the sanctuary, ends with God dealing with those abominations. And this is important because it teaches us as we are trying to understand what it is to know God, the sanctuary teaches us about how we can know God. It teaches us that God desires to dwell with us and be reconciled to us. It deals with how God is saving us. It deals with how God deals with sin. And it should come as no surprise that just as there were attacks by Satan on the sanctuary in Ezekiel's time, there are attacks on the sanctuary even today. False teachers who deny the substitutionary atonement of Christ, who deny that there is a sanctuary in heaven and a work going on there right now. There are those who deny the judgment and the judgment work going on in the sanctuary right now. There are those that deny the priestly work of Christ that is going on in the sanctuary right now. Which is why the little horn power and its papal deceptions attempt to cast the sanctuary out of heaven, according to Daniel 8, 11. But let's be clear. The little horn cannot throw the sanctuary out of heaven. The little horn cannot win. God will deal with the little horn. God will blot out the little horn. But what about you? What about each of us? Do we know him? Do we know his mercy? Yet, do we also know his justice? Do we want to know him? The sanctuary teaches us that he is the one who is dealing with sin, but he is the one that's sitting on his throne. He is the one that justifies us. He is the one that sanctifies us. He is the one that glorifies us. He is the one that strengthens us and sustains us. And he's the one that did it yesterday. He's doing it today. And he will do it tomorrow. And this is why the psalmist declares, thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Fanny Crosby was in need of financial help. God had always taken care of her, but in this instance, she really needed his help with some money. She began to pray. She believed that God was the one who strengthened and sustained her, and she prayed. And then one day, someone came and visited her. And the visitor stayed a while. And then as the visitor left, he shook Fanny Crosby's hand. And Fanny Crosby noticed that there was something between that person's hand and her hand. And when that person pulled their hand away, they left it in her hand. It was a bill it was the exact dollar bill that she needed that she had prayed for. She was so thankful that her first, her first thought was, what a wonderful way the Lord has helped me. And then the words came all the way, my Savior leads me. And she immediately wrote to him, and today we have that hymn. He is the one who wants to dwell with us. He is the one who wants to lead us. 
He is the one who justifies us. He is the one who sanctifies us. He is the one that glorifies us. He is the one that strengthens us and sustains us. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 